Welcome to lecture four in Phil's Critical Thinking, uh, part of our ongoing series of how to think about COVID and try to get a university degree at the same time. So today's topic is fallacies of presumption. We're going to do this uh, seven fallacies with some subcategories on top of that. Uh, I think I'm going to break it up into two videos. So we're going to do, I think, uh, four and then three. So fallacies of presumption. These are fallacies where there is uh, some hidden assumption or uh, missing information that only once you sort of identify the missing piece do you understand how the argument is convincing even though it is not a good argument. Just remind us ourselves uh, what the deal is with fallacies. These are arguments that fail. These are not arguments that are logically convincing. Uh, at the same time, they often look like they are. And so that's why uh, the fallacies that we're talking about are those fallacies that uh, are bad arguments that look good, that they'll trick you. They're a bait and switch. Remember that arguments are a series of statements intended to establish a conclusion. Uh, a good argument is if the premises are true, that is, makes the conclusion likely to be true. We learned that a valid argument, that very important word valid, is those arguments that guarantee the conclusion must be true. And these fallacies are not valid, they're not good. These are, are problematic arguments. Some of them, and we'll see some today, that sort of masquerade as valid arguments even though they're not good. So we're going we're to uh, get into that a little bit. So when we're looking at these presumption fallacies, we want to understand this concept of warrant and unwarranted presumptions and assumptions. This uh, concept of warrant in logic is an important one. Uh, and it's, it's almost as simple as it sounds. Uh, if you're familiar with, and I kind of hope you're not, the idea of having a warrant for your arrest, um, that means that someone has gone somewhere and convinced a judge or some authority that there is good reason for you to be rounded up and brought, uh, brought in. So warrant in law means sort of uh, a good reason has been proven. Um, when we talk about a, an idea having warrant or a statement having warrant, what we mean is that there is a good reason to accept it. And so really it's, it's good reason, right? So then you have an unwarranted presumption. That's a presumption you make without good reason. And uh, these are, so all of the, you're going to look at all these fallacies today where there's something that sneaks in without good reason. We're going to look at these. Uh, so if you want to see a list of all the fallacies, there it is. I'm plan to get to the end of converse accident in this first uh, uh, video. I'll take a pause and then uh, break it up so it's not ridiculously long. So let's get right into it. False cause. The form is to falsely identify cause based on coincidence. So this is an unwarranted presumption of cause, even when uh, there is no basis for that. And we're going to see, uh, when we get into the induction section of the course, attributing cause is pretty tricky. And so, in a way, it's not surprising that there's bad thinking here, because uh, the logic of this is complicated. Uh, as, a, as a very straightforward example, every time I fall asleep, it gets dark. And... Um, you know, you might think that if you're in the habit of going to bed uh, before it gets dark. Um, and, well, is that really a causal relationship or is it coincidence? Uh, the false cause fallacy has lots of variants, and those variants sometimes get uh, uh, Latin names. So we have co post hoc, cum hoc, and non causa. These are all slightly different versions. So the post is when Two, one thing succeeds another, you think, well, the first thing must have been the cause and the second the effect. Kamhawk is when two things always happen together, you think that therefore they're causal. 
uh, non-cause is sort of a, a more general category. Uh, I see a lot of reversing cause and effect. Um, you know, all Trump's talk about, uh, you know, uh, testing being the result of increased cases. We should stop testing in order to decrease the number of cases we have. Uh, I think that is uh, the fallacy of reversing cause and effect. The infection rate is causing the increasing testing results, not the other way around. There's a pretty good slogan to keep in mind here that scientists uh, like to keep front of mind, which is that correlation does not equal causation. Just be, Even if you have strongly correlated results, that does not mean that one thing causes another. And there's a great website called spuriouscorrelations.com, um, which uh, let's let's take a, a few minutes to look at this. So these are uh, correlations that are statistically significant, even though they are uh, clearly, sorry, I've got this organized here, um, clearly not, um, causally related. So first one, and uh, if you look at the um, uh, at the example in this, uh, it's, it's uh, spurious correlations. If you Google that, you'll this website will pop up first. So a statistical correlation here for those of you that might be in a stats class this term, 99.79%. Uh, that's that's correlated, right? That's that's as close as you can get, uh, uh, except that the two things that are correlated to that uh, accuracy are suicides by hanging, strangulation, suffocation, and U.S. spending on science, space, and technology. Why are those things correlated? It's probably, uh, probably random, right? Number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Again, now this is only correlation. Notice the graphs uh, spread around a little bit more, but a correlation of 66%. Eh, that's nothing to get too excited about. Per capita cheese consumption correlating with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. Uh, correlation of 94.7. That's, that's Pretty good. You know, if that was your master's thesis in some science uh, discipline, you know, you'd get a pass on that. Divorce rate in Maine, cor uh, correlating with per capita consumption of margarine. And having looked at the, uh, uh, the, the way he's gathered his data, he's looking at divorce rate in Maine versus U.S. national consumption of margarine. So it's not even people in Maine eating margarine, it's so all the people eating margarine are not, in this case, margarine's going down, uh, and so is the divorce rate. Uh, so, I'll, oh, well, there's one more good one here. Uh, age of Miss America correlating with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. What a way to go. Um, I didn't... And there's a whole bunch of stuff. We, we should probably come back to this one when we get to induction. There's a whole lot of stuff going on here that's uh, pretty interesting, right? The ages of Miss America is extremely narrow band of data. You know, the oldest being 25 and the youngest being, I guess, 18 and a bit. Because Well, it's, otherwise it would be really creepy if it was younger than that. Um, it's probably creepy anyway, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and of course, the murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects, uh, you know, anywhere between two and eight. So again, also a very small sample size or very small data range. And that's going to create all sorts of weird uh, statistical uh, effects when you have very small samples when you're comparing two things. So, uh, Thinking that those things are causally related because they coincide is, uh, is exactly the fallacy of false cause. Just as 
uh, thinking that uh, testing causes COVID cases because they seem they are rising together is the fallacy of false cause. Going back to our slides. So uh, some simple examples, the rooster crowing causing the sun to rise. Uh, and in, in, in that case, that is reversing cause and effect, right? It is in fact the sun causing the rooster to crow, but the way you tend to observe it is you don't open your eyes to notice the sun is out until the rooster crows. Uh, a, a quite popular for a long period of time uh, in terms of the origins of life on Earth was a theory called spontaneous generation. People observe that if you have the right living conditions for things, you tend to get them. So if you have rags and grain laying around, suddenly you got mice. Uh, if you have wet uh, protein, you get mold. Um, and then a Pasteur and the process of pasteurization uh, is the scientific discovery that if you sterilize something and don't allow new life to be introduced, that it'll remain sterile. So false theory. Why are we um, persuaded by this fallacy? Well, we're in fact fairly free in attribution of cause in everyday life. And I think, quite frankly, there's relatively little cost to being wrong about these things. Um, you know, little hom homo habilius uh, crouching by a fire uh, in a savanna somewhere uh, and heard some rustling in the brush behind... Uh, them didn't think, well, now, do I, should I examine carefully the causation of that rustling noise, or should I scramble up the nearest tree, um, right? There's a time and a place for very careful scrutiny, and that was not the right time and place. Um, often being wrong about causation has very little short-term cost, and often quite a lot of benefit. Uh, but that is is fine when you're uh, you know running away from wild animals or possible wild animals in the bush, uh, but not great if you're trying to run a country. So um, we get a lot of false positives that have very low cost, and so I think we get habitually sloppy about attribution of cause. We're going to learn that attribution of cause is really complicated. And so it's, we're not going to worry about that today. Stay tuned. But um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of pitfalls in this. Uh, I will say also that um, a lot of superstitions people have, whether it's wearing their lucky socks to hockey or... Uh, any sort of ritual that they might conduct, you know, oh, my favorite team is playing today, so I got to wear the, the the hat and the scarf or whatever, um, because I wore that before the team won. Well, you know, the cost of wearing that hat and scarf is pretty low. And if you thought that's what it was going to take to generate the right result, fantastic. The fact that you're wearing that scarf sitting on your couch and the game is in a whole different city probably means that the the causal relationship is is pretty uh, is, is not a real thing there's also some uh, harm in in being wrong about causes uh, when we uh, in previous uh, times had weird beliefs about uh, you know disease you know oh it's the reason I'm I'm coughing and and uh, getting uh, boils on my skin is because uh, the person across the road looked at me funny and not because uh, there's bacteria in the water supply uh, because we didn't look into the real cause of the disease uh, horrible things happened. So uh, anytime we're wrong about cause we're we're not going to come up with a solution. So some examples uh, here is Pav, you know, if you're in, in uh, psychology, you'll learn about Pavlov and his dog. And the dog here is wrong about what causes what, right? Um, 
Pavlov thought that he could make uh, the dog drool by conditioning it to expect food, and the dog thinks he's uh, conditioning Pavlov. I showed you the Spurious Correlations website. There's the uh, URL. And uh, if you think that um, attribution of cause is purely a statistical problem, that website shows you that there's some, there's got to be something more to it than that. You can have, per, and really, you know, and I, I don't know the, huge, the whole story there, although I should get his book and read it. Um, but I'm guessing, based on what I see there, is he's got some computer that's just randomly searching available data and, and looking for correlations. So he's got, you know, these huge data sets, and he's just looking for the random correlations that pop up. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's pretty smart. Probably uh, a bit of a uh, guy who's interested in stats and numbers. Special case of false cause is the slippery slope fallacy, sometimes called the domino fallacy. So this is, uh, you know, I think Canadians can probably relate to the idea of being on an icy hill and sliding to the bottom and being unable to stop. Um, and this in logic is really that same concept that if you accept a certain, take a, an initial step, there will be no way of stopping. So you're, and the presumption here is that there is, um, that there's, once you start the, the series of causes is unstoppable. That's the hidden presumption. So, uh, and the argument goes something like, well, you know, we don't want that inevitable result, so we must not grant even one minor uh, change or acceptance or anything like that. So here's an example of a slippery slope from just a couple of days, uh, in fact, maybe even today, um, that, uh, when, and Trump is trying to insinuate that uh, Joe Biden is on drugs, uh, and so he's actually got probably some innuendo here. Uh, problem is, what happens after that? That's an insinuation of a slippery slope, that once you have, uh, accept that Joe Biden might be on drugs, then some, and he's not even, he's being vague about what the, the uh, in, insinuation is. Uh, and this is quoted by uh, a columnist named Tommy Beer in Forbes magazine. Uh, uh, a, a big supporter of Donald Trump is this a guy named James Dobson, who's uh, an important American evangelical leader. Uh, he's got a book, Marriage Under Fire. Uh, I don't want to you know, get involved in the issue here, but these are perfect examples of slippery slope arguments on a topic which, quite frankly, in Canada, and this is why I'm choosing this example, uh, we did take this initial first step, and the sky didn't fall, right? We, so think about, he's, uh, Mr. Dobson is arguing that if you accept gay marriage, you won't be able to have laws against a polygamy, uh, three men or three women, or five men and two women, or marriage between daddies and girls, or a man and a donkey, right? So these are all... Uh, consequences this person thinks are uh, will be a inevitable causal chain starting from this first step. Now, uh, Canada and 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 quite frankly, since two thousand and four, many places in the U.S. have in fact accepted this step, and none of them have gone to this. So the inevitability of of this is clearly questionable because it hasn't happened. So that's what makes this a good example. I don't want to get bogged down into the, the action. The, this is not an ethics class. I don't want to get bogged down into that. But I think this is a great example just because society did make that choice and did, w did not run down the slope to all these others. So when we're replying to a slippery slope, the presumption, of course, is that uh, there is no uh, stopping point between the initial and the final cause. And so if you want to respond, 
don't you know point out that that that's a presumption that is contentious. If you can say, look, I think that we're going to stop with uh, just the genders of people getting married, not the numbers or the species. Uh, so there's some pretty natural stopping points here. Um, then I think you've confronted the slippery slope argument very effectively. So that's it for false cause. Next fallacy, begging the question. Uh, also has a few interesting names. Titio Percipi is the Latin name, which is basically uh, sort of literally saying, hey, you're assuming part one, right? Which is, and also known as circular reasoning, uh, also known as Catch-22 from a very great novel, about a World War II novel. Uh, in which uh, the army has a, a catch, which is that uh, the army, you know, in the army rule book, it says the army can do whatever it wants. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's that circular reasoning. In the very simplest form for any statement, therefore that same statement. Now, that's pretty obvious when you put the form that way. So usually when you're trying to slide this one by, you hide it, hide the presumption in with some other details. So you, you flow, you know, uh, some extra words around just to kind of create a little bit of camouflage. So uh, now what makes this one interesting is that this is going to actually be a valid argument. Remember, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true is the definition of valid. Let's look back at the form then. If the premise is true, the conclusion must be true. Well, if the premise and the conclusion is the same thing, it would satisfy that definition of valid. So, uh, I think that has a whole lot to do with why this is a fairly persuaded argument. It sounds pretty clinching. So, uh, for that reason, there is no counterexample as we've learned that, where you would have a obviously true premise leading to an obviously true uh, false conclusion. Um, so you, that would be, a, this would be, by the way, be a really great question on a quiz that um, can a fallacy be valid? Explain. So pretty persuasive because it sounds kind of iron, you know, clad. It sounds watertight. Of course, if A, then A. Uh, and so now if you want to respond to that, you have to sort of point out the, the circularity and reject it, which is harder than you think. So here's a, here's a great example. Uh, the news is fake because so much of the news is fake. Well, as an argument, <laughs> you know, that that's, wraps up in a bow pretty nice and tidy. Now, is the news fake is exactly debatable. Um, so, you know, is, I'm not necessarily going to accept the conclusion is true, but as an argument, it doesn't get any better. Uh, a couple, you know, exciting examples just to, to keep you awake in case you thought they were never going to get any controversy at all. So, uh, the Bible is the word of God. The word of God cannot be doubted, and the Bible states that the Bible is true. Therefore, the Bible must be true. Well, you can see how that makes a, a circle. And, you know, whether or not the Bible is true or not, um, this argument has the feature of being valid. So that's, that's something. Um, but it seems to assume exactly what it's also trying to prove. And so we would want to be cautious about that. I think that the when you see these circular arguments, the right approach is caution. Say, listen, I'm going to need some other evidence besides just restating itself. Uh, the same one here. Active euthanasia, uh, euthanasia is morally acceptable. Is a decent ethical thing to help another human being escape suffering through death. So now this is where we're starting to get into hiding the circularity a bit more subtly, right? So there's this is a circular argument. 
but it's one that uh, isn't obviously so the way this this one here is. Um, now, why is it circular? Well, because morally acceptable is pretty much exactly the same thing as decent and ethical, and helping another human being escape suffering through death is pretty much what we think euthanasia is. So what we really have here is the same statement twice using synonyms. And so uh, that's why it's a circular. So it's, actually, it's really the form X, therefore X, where the second time X is expressed, it's using different words to say the exact same thing. A little, some, some harder ones. Um, so murder is morally wrong. Active euthanasia is morally wrong. Uh, that is a circular argument if you grant the hidden premise, some, you know, something's implied here, that active euthanasia is the same as murder, which is, a, of course, a different definition than was previously used. And, and really what's going on in something like this euthanasia debate, or, or quite frankly, the, any of the other sort of controversial examples here, is what's up for debate isn't the structure of the argument, it's the definition of the terms. If you assume the, the definition of term in here, you get to your conclusion automatically. But in fact, assuming active euthanasia is murder is pretty much exactly what the, the argument is, is, is trying to prove. You can't start by assuming that. Capital punishment is justified for the crimes of murder and kidnapping because it is quite legitimate and appropriate that someone be put to death for having committed such hateful and inhuman acts. Well, again, capital punishment put to death, justified, legitimate, and appropriate, crimes of murder and kidnapping, hateful and inhuman acts, right? So we just have three synonyms leading to the same statement again. A special case of question begging is the question begging epithet. Uh, let's talk about the word epithet first. That's that, you know, pithy slogan, maybe it goes on your tombstone, right? Here lies Professor Phil, you know, he tried his best. Um, whatever, whatever, you know, is, you know, <laughs> COVID, lecturing in COVID finally did him in. Uh, whatever, you know, that epithet, that slogan, um, sometimes it's a single word. And uh, if you can hide your conclusion um, in, inside that, then you have um, circularity. So notice this criminal is charged with violently murdered the innocent victim. Well, notice that when you use the word criminal in that way, you're, because that word criminal has, at least in its legal sense, uh, the idea that the person has been found guilty. And so when you describe them as a criminal, then you kind of get ahead of yourself in saying, well, they must be guilty because they're a criminal. Uh, and so here's an example here uh, taken off of, I'll uh, just see if I can't get this a little clearer. There we go. Um, taken off of Facebook, I think, uh, earlier today. Uh, and this is about uh, Black Lives Matter stuff. Um, probably a straw man here, for those of you who want to go back and look. Please kill the, I always hear the same sentiment from the left. They knew the risk when they took the job. I'm not sure people are really saying that. That's That sounds like a straw man to me. But not, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is here. How come we can't apply this logic when criminals are killed during arrest? They knew the risk when they did the crime. Okay, so how do I know they're doing crime? Because they're criminals. Well, that's exactly that circular uh, appetite, right? If you call someone a criminal, of course it's legitimate to, to bring the force of law down on them. But well, they're not criminals all the time, right? So that's the circularity here. Uh, now, if we said, how come we can't apply this logic when innocent civilians are killed during arrest? They knew the risk when they did the crime. Well, suddenly that sounds pretty objectionable. So you, depending on what words you put there is going to really uh, influence how uh, effective the argument is. Okay, so that's circular reasoning. 
think I got a couple more examples of this. Uh, some straightforward ones. Bill O'Reilly once said he can't believe John Stewart because he's a liberal New York Jew. That epithet, at least for his audience, means something very specific about uh, trustworthiness. Um, the Ground Zero Mosque was words cooked up in some uh, political office somewhere to describe an Islamic cultural center. It wasn't at Ground Zero. It was only sort of a mosque. Um, but by calling it that, made a huge political issue out of something. So uh, those are question-begging epithets. Hiding your conclusion inside a name. And, you know, I, well, I, I, I was going to say I hate to pick on Donald Trump all the time, but actually I kind of enjoy it. But uh, this is one of his favorite tools, is to give someone, you know, the nickname. Uh, Lion Ted, Sleepy Joe, uh, Lion Hillary. Um, if he can get you to believe someone's name is, uh, you know, Lion Ted, you're probably not going to believe what Ted says. So um, that's question-begging epithets, a uh, part of circular reasoning. When you're looking at circular reasoning, and if you think you're confronted for it, um, your options are pretty limited, because after all, it is a valid argument. You can't say, aha, that's a fallacy. It's not a good argument, because it is. It's, uh, it's an ironclad argument. It's, it really is guaranteed to be valid. Uh, and the other thing is, let's face it, uh, the vast majority of people are not going to appreciate your uh, logical subtleties when you point them out. Just say, aha, circular reasoning. And maybe some of you have already experienced this. We're starting to learn about fallacies and you, uh, you're you around the dinner table with uh, some grouchy relative and you say, aha, that's the fallacy of, and they're like, you know, they don't care, right? Um, they think you're some uh, over-educated delete. Question begging epithet. So, um, so pointing out the circularity is is useful if you have other people that also want to be do their best to be good thinkers. But that's I don't know, unfortunately rare. So a more useful strategy is to try to break the circle by asking for more information. Sure, he's lying, Ted. But when exactly did he lie so much? Um, okay, the Bible's the word of the God. You got any other evidence? Uh, might be a way to to sort of to, to enlarge, you know, try to get out of that circle by saying let's let's try to add some more evidence. Uh, what I mentioned that not everyone thinks that circular reasoning is bad. Uh, this is from a website. Uh, I don't. I should check if it's still up there. Uh, I I ripped this off of that website some years ago, um, and I think it's fantastic. Be just because the person who put this together actually thinks circular reasoning is awesome. He calls it the wheel of power. For every question, you have a great answer. And uh, so. Well, how can we sure it's the Word of God? Because the Bible tells you so, but why believe the Bible? Because it's infallible. How you know it's infallible? It's the Word of God, and around and around you go. And uh, I don't want to be uh, negative, unnecessarily negative about this. Uh, I think that there's uh, plenty of good reasons to have sincere religious belief. This person thinks that this is really great. Um, I'm hoping that we, we see that um, we would we would want to have some more evidence. We would be it would be sort of unsatisfying if this was the the end of it. We would want something more. Next fallacy: sweeping generalization. Fall uh, there's other names for this, also known as AKA fallacy of accident or dicto simpliciter. Uh, which is just Latin for you're saying it too simply or without qualification. Um, and the form is, if usually X is an A, then X is an A in a particular case. So, um, this is uh, actually think from the same Facebook uh, uh, conversation as the... Uh, the criminal crime one a few mentioned a few moments ago 
in the case of kids, they're usually kids with nothing better to do, so they're involved in gangs or whatever. Uh, poverty plays a huge role. None of these things. So notice that usually here goes to an, a universal claim, right? We get mostly uh, as a, you know, mostly, typically, usually uh, a word that, you know, covers most but not all. And then suddenly we get to none and all kinds of words in the conclusion. And so that's, uh, that's the problem with these, going from usually to every time is unreliable. Now, uh, we rely on this quite a bit, right? Uh, if something's usually the case, you know, in ordinary life, when there's not too much on the, on the line, go for it. But, uh, you know, if you say an airplane's usually safe, are you going to get on? Right? So notice our standards for going from usually to always are going to be contextual. And that's part of what's going on here. I would argue in the case of the police uh, violence case that, you know, police officers are usually pretty good is both true and not good enough, right? We want that to be universally true, not just usually true, even if that usually is some incredibly small percentage. Counterexample, remember something that's obviously true and then a premise is obviously true, obviously false. So just based on the evidence here, this person is from Beverly Hills and therefore she must be rich and famous. Uh, not, I don't know, based, I hate to judge people just, uh, you know, on a superficial glance. Could be that this is a famous actress researching a role as a bag lady, uh, but, you know, could also just be what it seems. Very famous example from Plato, uh, and these accident and converse accident uh, fallacies uh, often get described in logic textbooks as, uh, and then there's a little sort of tangent on moral reasoning right after because uh, historically um, it's ethically problematic to go from usually to always, right? So the, the case uh, Plato described when he was discussing ethics is the case of a friend who uh, has uh, a sword that belongs to the other, the other person and has promised, okay, when you ask for the sword back, I'll give it to you. I've borrowed it or you've, you've given it to me for safekeeping. When you ask for it back, absolutely, you'll get it back. And then that friend shows up drunk and mad and angry and says, our mutual friend, I'm going to get your sword and I'm going to run him through. And Plato asks the obvious question, what do you do? Do you return the sword as you promised? Or do you break your promise, save your friend's life? And, pro and quite frankly, since uh, the penalty for murder in that society was also death, they're both going to die, right? Your drunken friend is going to die as punishment for murdering your other friend. You're going to lose two friends. What do you do? And um, it seems like the, although usually you should honor your promises, there might be exceptional cases. And that sort of uh, discussion of, you know, universal pr principles like keep your promises versus the subtleties of very particular individual cases is a lot of what you talk about when you're, when you're doing ethics and philosophy. Uh, and... You know, the idea that every principle is universal, uh, I think, is, is shown to be a weak assumption based on an example like that. When you're looking at sweeping generalizations, uh, usually I try to think of counterexamples that are based on what, I, what a lot of people call the law of large numbers. So if someone says, oh, the number of, uh, you know, cases of police violence to innocent civilians is, is absurdly rare. You say, well, actually, you know, if you have, if it's only a hundredth of a percent and there's, you know, 300,000 or at least in Canada, say 35 million people, that means like, you know, a couple thousand cases a year. 
numbers. Okay, that's not good, right? So the law of large numbers is that whenever something is, no, no matter how small a fraction of a percentage something is, when it happens repeatedly, you're eventually going to get something uh, measurable. And so you know, even if something's usually safe or, or rarely happens, you, you know, let's say like airplanes, if they're just usually safe and there's thousands of them taking off every day, they're going to crash if they're just usually safe. We need it to be guaranteed safe. Uh, I taught medical ethics many years ago to uh, first-year doctors, and it's really kind of funny because, uh, you know, they're taught in med school that if, if a of a risk is less than one in a thousand cases, then ah, it's a negligible risk and they don't really need to get into it with the patient. And I, I always uh, argued with those uh, really smart people uh, that, wait a minute, uh, two things. First of all, that patient you're saying one in a thousand isn't significant. They might bought a lottery ticket that's like one in a billion and think they have a serious chance at winning. And so your perception of odds versus theirs is totally different. The second thing is, uh, you, the doctor, how many times are you going to perform this operation? Right? If the risk of uh, injecting a vaccine or uh, doing a, a, a medical surgery uh, is, is one in a thousand, probably you're going to do that a thousand times over the course of your career. So it's going to happen to you, the doctor, even if it's unlikely to happen to the person, the patient. And so I, I hope I convinced some of them to treat uh, risks a little bit more seriously than I think the message they were getting at the time. That's, this is this is a long time ago, okay? So I think it's better, but uh, I always had qualms about that. Genetic fallacy. Uh, this is a subcategory of the sweeping generalization. This is where the um, the the sweeping generality comes from something about the origin. Now. Genetic here refers, this is the word genetic and, the, and fallacy is actually older than the word gene as a bio, biological term, right? Genetic is just a, a word synonymous with origin. So that when they're trying, what do we call these little things that are part of uh, DNA? Uh, let's call them genes. Uh, that's actually using the same root word. So this is not genetic as in... Uh, you know, 20, you know, 23 and me or whatever the, the DNA stuff. This is origin fallacy. So when you rely on uh, the origin of something to draw a conclusion, then you have genetic fallacy. And the example that comes first to my mind here is the prostations uh, Donald Trump makes about the origins of the Russian investigation, that the people who started that investigation are people that probably not big fans of Donald Trump. And so the origin is suspect. Uh, and then he thinks that therefore the entire investigation should be discounted. Uh, so that's exactly the genetic fallacy. Origin, therefore, conclusion. The hasty generalization is the reverse of what we've just been talking about. So this is going instead from usually to all, this is now uh, going to uh, from some to all, right? So that we have um, uh, and uh, often we call this anecdotal evidence, right? So uh, my uncle drank like a fish and he lived to be 94, so being an alcoholic doesn't affect your health. Well, uh, that's a single case. You would want more substantial investigation before you drew that conclusion for everyone. Why is this persuasive? I'll invite you to think about cooking a pot of pasta. And you're able to, after a few moments of elapse, to say, huh, I wonder if it's done. And you pull out a single strand and whether you stretch it, you know, this is a cultural thing, right? 
Some people stretch, some people throw, some people taste. Whatever your, uh, whatever your social uh, tradition is, great. Notice the important part is your, that single strand is taken as an indication of the readiness of, the, of all the pasta in the pot. So why, if a single case is good for the pasta, is a single case not good for uh, alcoholism and health? And I think that's exactly uh, the problem here. We're, <coughs> excuse me, we're not particularly good at judging when samples are uh, fairly measured by individual cases and when we need much more data. The reason it works in the pasta case is just because all the pasta is the same. Imagine you were, uh, you know, it's getting to the end of term and you're a little short on money and you and your roommates in your, uh, you know, your social isolation realize that you've only got a little bit of, of ordinary pasta and then you've got some whole wheat artisan made pasta from the farmer's market and you've got some quinoa pasta that's gluten free and maybe you've got the shells and the strands and spaghetti and, and macaronis and you throw it all in a pot and then you pull a single strand of spaghetti and you say well this is done so I guess it's all good to go you realize pretty quick that the mistake is uh, not all those pastas are going to cook at the same rate. And I would say when you draw sweeping generalizations about anything, especially people, you want to ask yourself, are we all from the same pot or are we coming from different places? Because if we are, I shouldn't judge all by the one. And uh, so the mistake is I always saying on too little evidence, we're going to go to too large a sample. Some examples, uh, if we allow sick people to use marijuana, we should allow everyone to use marijuana. Well, I guess, I guess Canada went that way. Um, I once had a student argue uh, with me after hearing uh, that I had allowed a, a student with a diagnosed disability uh, to have an alternate uh, exam format, uh, argued that I, the, the perfectly able and um, and right ready student should be given the same consideration. I would argue in that case that the the exceptional uh, nature of the of the one case did not apply to all students. So hasty generalizations are often based on individual testimony. We we sometimes call that anecdotal rather than aggregated results. Sorry, as the light conditions keep changing here, I gotta just sort of adjust these. Uh, so if, if I think this is a made up quote I got from somewhere, but I interviewed 10 people on Main Street in Greenwood on Friday night and they all stated they would rather be there than watching TV. I conclude that the folks in Greenwood don't like to watch TV on Friday night. Now, you don't need to be a uh, uh, you know, a super critical thinker to, to see that there's some problems here, right? If you see, okay, 10 people, not that many, plus they were on Main Street on Friday night, and that makes sense because if they did rather watch TV on TV on Friday night in Greenwood, they wouldn't have been out in the street to get interviewed in the first place. So here we have a reporter uh, making all sorts of anecdotal conclusions based on on pretty shoddy uh, basis and you know folks uh, we're gonna see over the next 40 or so days on the news every night there's gonna be interviewing some some uh, biker or trucker or lawyer on uh, the street in some town in, in anywhere's USA and then the well so you can see that everyone's voting for so-and-so or such-and-such right um, to the extent that you take that seriously, it shouldn't be on the individual case. It should be on uh, a more systematic way of measuring that, which is what polling is going to be. And uh, 
we'll probably try to do, uh, I don't know if we're going to get the induction around the time of the US. Yeah, actually, the timing might work out that we'll do uh, some look at induction pretty much on U.S. Election Day. We'll see whether the polls were accurate or not. That might be a pretty good thing to look at. Okay. So, hasty and sweeping generalization. I think of them as two sides of the same coin. So let's think about which side is up when. So uh, we want to, if we want to know if it's hasty or is it sweeping, we want to know where's the general statement. If the general statement, that's the all statement, the every. If it's in the premise, it's a sweeping conclusion. If it's in the conclusion, it's a hasty generalization. So uh, in the examples, sweeping generalization, most P's are S's, therefore this particular P is an S, right? So you're going from uh, the most is in the premise. Hasty, this particular is an S, so the particular is in the premise, therefore the generality is in the conclusion. So let's look at an argument. Let's let's it's time to start getting serious here and start looking at some examples. So is this a hasty generalization? Cyclists all think they own the road. I nearly ran over one yesterday who turned right in front of me. Okay, so there's an argument. What do we need to do? So we some of the basic concept stuff, we need to say, okay, what's the premise? What's the conclusion? Are there any indicator words? Well, this example is pretty typical of the way we speak ordinarily, which is we don't give ourselves a whole lot of help, right? I don't see a therefore. I don't say, you know, oh, here's the premise. Uh, no one's marking this up with a white on a whiteboard to say premise, line, conclusion. So what is the conclusion here? If you're not sure, one of the things you want to do is, well, try it both ways. Okay, so let's assume cyclists all think they own the road. Therefore, I nearly ran over one yesterday who turned right in front of me. Does that make sense? Did you run over one because cyclists think they own the road? Let's try it the other way. I nearly ran over a cyclist yesterday who turned right in front of me. Therefore, cyclists all think they own the road. Okay, that's uh, at least an argument that you can imagine someone making. Now, is it a fallacy? Seems like going from a particular case of one cyclist to all cyclists seems like a hasty generalization. So that's how, as we assess these fallacies, that's how we're going to be doing this. I'm going to end the, the uh, part one of the uh, fallacies of presumption here. Uh, for those of you who are enjoying uh, the Donald Trump examples, let me just say this. It seemed at first like the only uh, benefit of having Trump elected president was that we were going to have four years of fabulous fallacy examples. This, the man is uh, just a fallacy machine. Uh, so much so that uh, there's a book called Fallacious Trump, a website and a book and a podcast. All any, if you want Trump fallacies, they got them. Okay, so if you want to rec if you want to learn about fallacies, letting Donald Trump do something for you, uh, I recommend this podcast, and you can go through the podcast episodes, and he does one on every particular fallacy. So you can look at that for the fallacies we've covered. Um, I'm also, even though they're his, I mean, in in my time teaching critical thinking, never before has someone so uh been you know such blatant use of fallacies plus been so newsworthy that a lot of people knew what he said on a day-by-day -day basis it seemed like a huge gift uh for teaching logic so uh at the same time uh, i've i've learned over the last few years that uh Trump will also elicit such uh, emotional reactions in people that it's really hard to actually assess his statements logically. You know, people tend to either uh, buy in or opt out. 
and not um, not follow him logically at all. Um, so, in fact, Trump is sort of the ever he's not the entry level fallacy maker. He's the Mount Everest. And to climb that, we need to do much more basic work first. Okay, that's it for part one. Have a great day.